Um, hi, my name is Alyssa Bradley. Um, I am a PhD student at the University of Wisconsin Madison, as you can tell by my Bucky Badger here. Um, I work with Dr. Rebecca Larson, who presented earlier uh, this morning. Um, and I'm going to present my master's project, which was uh, the effect of a wood biochar amendment to sand on leachate water quality with repeated dairy manure application, and it was a soil column study. Try saying that any times fast. Uh, all right, so a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to give you a little introduction about why we did this project. Um, I'm going to explain my experimental design. I'm going to go over the results from the leachate portion of the study. Then I'm going to go over, we did some nutrient retention results at the end of the column study where we took the columns apart and looked at what was in them. Um, some conclusions from the study. And then uh, as a soil column study, there were some inherent limitations. So I'm going to talk about those um, and some recommendations for future work um, if anybody so desired. All right, so a quick introduction about why we did this. Um, nitrate, as we, talk, as we heard about earlier, um, is a pretty prevalent groundwater pollutant. Um, it's actually our most prevalent groundwater pollutant in Wisconsin. Um, the EPA limits for drinking water are about 10 milligrams per liter. Um, and in with this uh, is a figure uh, for Wisconsin, um, and it's that 90% of nitrate groundwater um, is attributable to agricultural systems. Um, most of the wells that are above the recommended are in areas of concentrated um, animal operations as well. So we're trying to solve that problem. Um, and how we are doing this is with uh, biochar. Um, and does, is anybody terribly familiar with biochar or not terribly familiar with biochar? Okay, so we got a couple people who are pretty familiar, a couple people who aren't, so I'll talk a little bit more about what it is. Um, so the definition that we have here is that it is a carbon-rich substance produced as a co-product by the thermal degradation of organic matter under a limited supply of oxygen. But there are various ways to produce biochar. Um, pyrolysis is, is the one that my biochar was produced by, and it's between like uh, about 250 degrees Celsius to like five, seven hundred, there's a huge variation in temperatures that you can produce biochar at. There's a large variation of uh, processes. There's slow pyrolysis, which is a quick reaction. There's or a slow reaction. Uh, there's fast pyrolysis, which is a quick reaction. There's um, gasification, which is an extremely quick reaction. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit more about the one that we use here. Um, so um, a few things about biochar. It's very porous, very low density, high surface area. Um, those are sort of the more important things for what I'm going to talk about. All right, so the experimental design for what we did. Um, the biochar that we used was made from um, a hybrid poplar grown in northern Wisconsin. Um, we made it from poplar chips. Um, one of the other guys on our campus had a lab who was using it and producing the biochar, so we, we sort of went along with what he was doing. Um, they used a slow pyrolysis process, so they put biochar in the reactor for about an hour. Um, at 450 degrees Celsius. As I said, there's a huge range of temperatures and conditions, so this is just what we used in the feedstock that we used. Um, and we applied it to soil columns at rates of 0% um, for control, 1%, 2%, and 5% by weight in, our, in soil columns. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about that here. Um, so we have 5% columns. We did a uh, rep four replicates for each for each treatment, so 5%, 2%, 1%, 0%, and then a control, which uh, was packed the same way, just uh, sand, um, sorry, we used sand as a, as the medium um, to rep, because uh, biochar tends to perform better in poor quality soils, um, so we applied it to a sandy soil to see what it would do as opposed to a siltier soil where it might not do as much. Um, let's see, so we have the control, each of the treatments. Um, each of these treatments received periodic manure applications. We used manure from a local dairy. It was liquid manure, um, about 5.5% solids content. Um, we, we loaded up the columns pretty well. We used about twice what was recommended um, by local nutrient management guidelines. Again, we wanted to see what the biochar did. Um, so we, we wanted to load it up pretty high. Um, Uh, eight inch soil column depths, um, eight inch or about 20 centimeters, um, is about typical plow depth. So that's how we envisioned, that was the depth that we envisioned that it would be applied to in a field if it got that far. Um, I think that's probably about it for this slide. If I forgot something, I'll mention it later when it becomes important. Uh, so we had leaching events, like I said, we had uh, dairy manure applications, and those were applied four times over the course of a year, so roughly every uh, three months. 
and we had leaching events every two weeks. So we applied manure and then did leachate, waited two weeks, did leachate, waited two weeks, did leachate, waited two weeks, et cetera, and then reapplied manure and repeated the process four times. Um, so for each leaching event, you can see we collected in little buckets, so it was gravity drained. Um, and when the leachate came out, we measured the total volume, the pH of the leachate, the biological oxygen demand, uh, BOD5, which is a test that's basically a test of water quality, um, nitrite, nitrate, nitrite, that's just what our particular machine did. We used a steel AQ2 discrete analyzer. We got the nitrate number from subtraction here. Uh, we measured total phosphorus, total nitrogen, uh, total Keldol nitrogen sometimes to, as a check for our TN method. Um, and we also started measuring ammonia after the second manure application set. All right, um, so here, this picture is of the leachate. Um, we've got the leachate coming out of the 5%, the 2%, the 1%, the no biochar, and then the control columns. The control columns didn't receive manure, which is why they're so lovely and clear. Um, I really liked this photo. It was taken, I think, the second leaching event after the third manure application. Um, and I think it just did a really good job of sort of visually showing, like, the biochar acts pretty well as a filter. Um, so we've got this kind of lighter color in the high biochar, a little bit darker color in the, and to this no biochar, we've got this really kind of dark, nasty color after our manure application. So results, I've got quite a few of these. I'm going to present most of the parameters, not all of them. Um, so I'm going to point out that this is a very narrow band of pH ranges, so it's not like there was huge, huge differences in the pH, but the 5% biochar did have overall sort of a higher pH. And then we got the 2%, the 1%, and the zero for the control, or not the control, the, the 0% higher check. Um, you can see that we've got these kind of funny dips in the pH periodically. Um, that was when we applied manure. Um, the sand that we used was very high pH, I think like 9.2, and the bio, or the sand was 8.9. And the biochar that we used had a pretty high pH as well, about 9.2, which is probably most of the reason that the fact that the pH results fall this way, um, but the manure that we applied had a lower pH than the combination, so we think that's why we saw these dips. Not really that important, but just in case you were wondering. Um, so our BOD5 results. Um, so the BOD for each leaching event um, really peaked the in the leaching event right after manure application. So that's what I have presented here because it, it peaked and then it just went down and there was pretty much nothing until the next manure application and then it peaked and then there was pretty much nothing. Um, so that's why I'm presenting it this way. Um, the, the results from the no biochar column are much higher than for the one and the two and the five percent. So you can see that the biochar performed pretty well um, in reducing BOD, which like I said, is sort of a water quality indicator. Um, we didn't have data for the first one. BOD is kind of a tricky test. I misguessed, my fault. Um, but this is for the other, the other three manure application events. So we also measured uh, total nitrogen in the leachate. We did this for all of the events. This is the start to the end of our about five year. I'm, I have it as leaching events here, but that's about two weeks between uh, each, each number here, or four weeks between each number because it skips. Um, so you can see that we've got the 0%, this is the cumulative TN over the course of the study. Um, we've got the 0% accumu cumulative in the leachate, very, very high, and then the 1%, the 2%, and the 5%. This graph came out really nicely, didn't it? Um, and as I said with the BOD, that there were big spikes in the leaching event right after each manure application. That also happened with the TN. That's not super, super clear here. But you can see that it kind of goes up and then flattens out as we leach and leach and leach. And then it goes up after the fresh manure application, and then it goes out as the leaching and leaching goes up. So that's what's happening there. Um, so we got, like I said, really good reduction. I think that's less than 50% maybe um, in the 5% that we did in the 0%, so that's pretty good. Uh, nitrate, which is the one that we were really concerned about because that's the big issue in the groundwater. Um, same sort of pattern. We've got the 0% high, 1%, 2%, and the 5% down here. Um, and sort of the same idea with the peaks that I was talking about, how it goes up and flattens out, goes up a little bit, flattens out. Not quite as pronounced in this one, but still the same general trend. Um, so this I thought was really interesting. If anybody was in the morning session, Nicole talked about um, nitrate concentrations, and I mentioned earlier that 10 milligrams per liter is kind of the limit. 
um, or it's the drinking water limit. Um, so I wanted to sort of show this to show you how the nitrate concentration changed. Um, and actually, this kind of supports Nicole's point about timing, timing, timing. Um, these, the manure application events occur here. And then the week after when we leach, we see these huge spikes in uh, nitrate nitrogen for <coughs> all of the columns. Um, but the biochar did overall, except for this guy, uh, did a pretty good job of, of metering those. Um, so I wanted to present that as well, because that's sort of an important uh, aspect of why we do this. <laughs> we also measured ammonia starting after the second manure application. I see this starts at the eighth leaching event, which was the second manure application event. Um, and same thing, ammonia had uh, much more um, pointed peaks, if that makes sense. Um, so ammonia, we would apply the manure, apply the leachate, ammonia would spike in the leachate, and then it would flatten out to almost nothing in almost all cases. Um, again, cumulative ammonia in the leachate over the course of the study, we've gotten 0% much higher than the 1, the 2, and the 5. The 5 actually leached practically no ammonia in the last 20, 40 weeks of our study, which was pretty interesting. Um, we also measured phosphorus in the leachate, which had sort of an opposite trend. Um, so phosphorus in the leachate didn't really do much. I think it was accumulating in the columns for a while here. And then once we sort of saturated our columns, it shot up. Um, the 5% if you, uh, leached quite a bit more than the 2% and then the 1% and the 0% right down here. Um, I mentioned earlier that biochar has a much lower density than, um, or it, ha it has a very, very low density period. Um, <coughs> and the columns were eight, up, packed to an eight inch depth. Um, so actually the 5% column here had quite a bit less material overall than the 2% which had a little bit less material than the 1% which had a little bit less than the 0%. So I think that that may have contributed to why we saw this pattern here, um, that there was just less sorption sites for the phosphorus to find to. Um, but um, overall actually, even, even though the 5% the biochar leached quite a bit of phosphorus, um, I applied over the course of the study, I think, 300 milligrams um, total to each column. So we still see less than 10% of the total phosphorus being leached, even with the, with the higher biochar, which performed not quite as well for phosphorus. Um, so I was all excited about these results because I'm like, oh, great, it's like accumulating nitrogen in the column. They'll be all available to plant later. And then at the end of the study, we took the columns, we cut them apart, we saw what was in them, and it turned out that they all retained pretty much the same amount of nitrogen. When I thought, I was like, kind of, oh man, lame, what's going on here? Um, well, we did a mass balance, so we didn't actually measure any emissions, um, but we did, we did sort of calculate what we thought was going out to the air, and you can see that this 5% biochar column leached, I should probably explain what this means, the blue is leached, the orange is retained, and the gray is calculated what we emitted based on mass balance. Um, so we saw this great reduction in leachate with the 5%, the high biochar application in nitrogen, about the same retention for all of them, and then this sort of emitted nitrogen in the 5% that was much higher than the 2 and the 1 and the control column. Um, so a couple of reasons that this might have happened. Um, we think that um, a lot of ammonia might have been, might have been leached there. Um, the test that we used, uh, so biochar, after I saw this, I kind of went mining through the literature to find out what happened. Um, and biochar has been shown to adsorb ammonia gas. Um, and the test that we used for this retained nitrogen didn't really account for that. So it may have been adsorbed in the columns and then just all gone off. It may have gone off before. Like I said, we didn't actually measure the emissions, so we don't really know for sure what happened. Um, could be in any sort of form. So it could be good, could be bad. Um, sort of take what you will from that, I guess. <laughs> so phosphorus, we had a lot of retention, or um, more leached in the, yeah, a lot of retention, which is this orange. Um, we assumed nothing emitted, because phosphorus doesn't really do that. Um, and then more leached in the 5%, 2%, 1%, and 0%, but overall below 10% of what we applied this leach to phosphorus in the course of our year study with the high raping rates and the high uh, water applications. So, some quick conclusions. Um, hybrid poplar in Bio, uh, hybrid poplar biochar in sand, which was simulating poor quality soil, um, increased leachate pH, decreased leachate BOD5, uh, decreased leachate nitrogen in pretty much all forms, which was interesting. Um, there was some increased TP in leachate, um, but before we get too excited, um, there were some limitations. Like I said, it was a soil column study, so there were some inherent limitations. It was constant temperature throughout the year. The precipitation was simulated. It was deionized water, so it was really clean. Um, 
there were no plantings on top of it. It was just soil with the manure on top and the leaching, um, which might have changed things. And we also did not actually measure any soil emissions, um, which going forward, we would probably do that again. Um, so recommendations for future work would be to measure, some, do some more um, work on end cycling um, and how the microbial community works in, in soil columns and how biochar affects them. Um, and mechanisms for the changes, why we might have seen um, large emissions with the, with the more biochar but less leaching. Um, effect on emissions, which I just said, and crop yields would be interesting. Field trials would be really important. Um, and then alternative application strategies. Like I said, the biochar was really um, not very dense, um, and a 5% application to a field is completely impractical. You would never want to do that. That would be very silly. It's like a 25% volume. Um, so I was sort of thinking that um, alternative ways to use this might be in, I think we talked about vegetated filter strips earlier today, but that might be a more appropriate application for biochar or as a filter um, in and of itself. Um, so with that, are there any questions? Questions for Alyssa? Oh boy, okay. <laughs> so did you, um, what's the ash content of your biochar? The ash content of the biochar? Um, I am actually not entirely sure. We, we washed it beforehand, so there shouldn't have been any ash um, in it. Well, it depends if it's soluble or not. Yeah, okay, so, that's true. Uh, but I wonder if you look at how much phosphorus, could the phosphorus actually be coming from your ash? Um, I did kind of look at that, and I don't think that that's true. Because it's correlated to the amount of uh, uh, biochar you add. And so you also need a mechanism for, for, for stalling the phosphorus. What's the, what would be the mechanism for either nitrate or phosphorus? I'm interested in how biochar retains anions. Yeah, well, we were, we were sort of thinking that it might be adsorption, but after seeing the, the size, we think that it might be more microbial, microbially mediated changes. Okay. Um, but we don't really, we kind of ran out of money for the microbial funding. <laughs> so <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't really get that like we'd hoped to. Um. <coughs> Any speculation on how long the biochar would last, say, put it in a vegetative strip? Do you think it would be an annual application? Or yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, some, some of the literature seems to think that it'll go on for thousands of years. I think that's a little much. Um, I think like five to ten years might be a little more practical because then also, um, like I said, there was a constant temperature in this soil pump study. Well, if you had water getting into those little pores and you had freeze thaw cycles, you'd have it all breaking down. It might wash out. There's a lot of a lot of potential <laughs> issues with that. And not a lot of field studies so far with biochar. Um, and honestly, the ones that have been performed have been kind of meh, might do good things, not really. I'm not super excited about it. Sorry if my presentation is less than like <coughs> glowing about biochar. I'm just kind of in the middle about it still, so. So maybe I missed that one. How did you apply the biochar as a layer or did you mix? I did. I completely mixed it. Sorry, I did not talk about that at all. I actually took it in a little jar, mixed it, shook it all together, put it in in increments and packed it um, so it was completely mixed in there, um, which again is not going to be a practical application study in a field and, and in the or soil strategy soil, in a field. I'm sorry. Kind of, in the soil column, what kind of you know, uh, compaction did you maintain? Like what kind of... Oh boy, I think that the... <laughs> because it will play a you know, huge role based on your leachate, based on like... Yeah, so I just sort of hand packed it down and I did do calculations. I don't remember off the top of my head what the what the densities were for each of the columns. Um, I am sorry about that. I can I can let you know later if you want. Look look back into my thesis. Just to build on that, how about the manure? Did you layer that on top? Or yeah, the manure was layered on top and actually it, it created a nice <coughs> little film of organic material at the end, which we actually took off and measured what was in that to account for that in our mass balance. So that also was not incorporated, which would probably would be done in a field. I mean, there's multiple ways to do manure application. But. And a follow-up of that one, because whenever I look at the soil column, you don't have enough, switch the you presentations know, while you're you don't have enough you know, head space to apply your manure. So whenever you apply your manure, so did you apply in a practical application rate, like what was the rate? High, it was very high, it was twice the... like, you know, 10,000? Yeah, 20,000. 20, it was to double what our local nutrient management plans recommend. Um, yeah, so it was a high application because we wanted to see what happened with the biochar over the course of the study, so. Yeah, when you said you measured ammonia, were you really measuring ammonium? Um, so, <laughs> I was hoping nobody would ask about that one. Um, our, we used a field AQ2 um, discrete analyzer <coughs> for our test. And the method says that it measures both ammonia and ammonium. I'm, I question that a little bit. I question the validity of that. Um, and like I said, the soil test that we used at the end only measured ammonium. 
Um, so that's another reason that I would definitely recommend moving forward to do some sort of emissions testing because I have a suspicion that there was a lot of ammonia runoff in that in that emissions. So, okay. I need to move on. Oh yeah, sorry. Give her a hand. <laughs>